webinar. Um, can I get your attention, please? So today's topic is the National Ecological Site Handbook, Section 1, Policy, Procedures, and Workflow. Our presenters, we have two presenters today. It will be uh, Susan Andrews and George Peacock. Today's webinar will be recorded and then made available later online in the next couple of days. Uh, if you have a question, you'll have to submit that uh, in writing using the Q&A tab at the top of your live meeting frame. Everybody is in listen-only mode, and so you won't be able to ask a question over the phone. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susan. Thank you, Sean. Uh, this is Susan Andrews, and uh, George and I will be giving an overview of the first section of the new uh, NRCS National Ecological Site Handbook. And I've already forgotten my tutorial on how to advance the slides. For those of you who are relatively new to ecological sites, uh, they've been uh, used in the age agency for, uh, well, since the 90s, but in uh, 2009, Chief White uh, signed a decision memo to accelerate ecological site description development. And there was a national bulletin that went out subsequent to that that uh, said that it was respon the responsibility of both uh, the SSRA and S&T. And it actually went so far as to say uh, which deputy area was responsible for what. And you can see here, you know, S&T was to lead the implementation and the development of interpretations. SSRA was uh, inventory, QA, QC. And uh, my, my very first marching order when I uh, came here uh, a little over two years ago was to develop the standard, which turned into a handbook pretty quickly. And um, we also, uh, those of us, you know, looking at, at how we were going to uh, eat this elephant realized so very quickly that it wasn't something that we could uh, easily parse out and you do this and you do that. It's, it's something that is collaborative and that we have to work together to make happen. And so really everyone is, um, you know, working on all parts and George and I are co-leads on the standards development. the right way this time. And so the purpose of the standards are to provide guidelines and definitions, policy responsibilities, you know, to give people a general idea of this collaborative process to develop ESDs. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it's interdisciplinary. It's also interagency. We have an MOU with both the Forest Service and uh, BLM, and they have produced an interagency manual and handbook. Uh, however, theirs is solely for range sites. This uh, new handbook for NRCS is uh, for range and forest, and we will be, uh, we do have the mandate to do all lands, which is a uh, large, a large elephant, and so we will be adding additional information as as those methods are developed. Um, we also are getting feedback from non-governmental organizations, universities, other partners, including notably SRM, uh, the Society for Range Management, and uh, also the uh, National Cooperative Soil Survey. Going the right way. Yes. So we have uh, we uh, convened a group of almost 40 people to initially to develop the handbook. We had an outline and prioritized the the pieces and parts of the uh, um, of the outline. What to work on first? What what do people in the field need to know most quickly? And um, and the group divvied up, and and that's how. We worked it. In the end, um, uh, George and George's staff and my staff um, ended up being co-leads on on everything, um, just just it, to you know make sure workflow continued and everything. Because uh, we, we all had had the you know we're under the gun, whereas other people had lots of other things on the plate. But it, it 
was uh, my staff, the so-called unique ecosystems branch at um, the uh, National Soil Survey Center, Georgia staff at the uh, Nas at the Central uh, NS uh, Central um, National Technology Support Center. I can only say East. Um, at, and he's the leader of the National Grazing Lands team there. Um, many specialists from the NTSC's uh, state staffs um, and uh, regional offices, the old MOs, and um, other, uh, other staffs from around the country. Uh, the primary benefits of having a handbook are to improve the consistency, um, and we really are are moving this to be throughout the, the U.S. It, prior to this acceleration, it, uh, ESDs were used primarily in the West um, and into the central states. But um, so this consistency is, you know, not only throughout the U.S. but even within the Western uh, regions because there there were differences in the application and the way ESDs were done. Um, again, we've got this mandate for all lands, which is a you know is a a big um, a big goal. And um, one of the things that we hope um, that we are adding, and we are using a lot of the the same techniques, the MLRA process and the correlation processes uh, from soil survey to um, add quality control, quality insurance, and uh, the correlation process. Um, today, we're talking about section one, but the, but the major sections of the handbook are, uh, there are three, uh, policy and procedures, um, concept and description development, and then section three is sort of a grab bag of uh, additional information. Um, and you can you can see it here, delineation and mapping, hierarchies, and other stratification schemes, which will be filled out for um, you know, both other land uses and then also um, highly managed lands like cropland. And we will have a glossary and references. The overview of, of so that was that was the intro. So. Just what we're going to go over today is I want to make sure everyone knows that there was a national bulletin that was released um, last month, and it is calling for uh, review and comments of the um, of the National Ecological Site Handbook, and there um, and approximately half of it has been released at this time. And today we're going over just the section one. And at this time on Thursday, we'll be going over the uh, section two. None of the section three parts have been released at this time. We, the second half the, to complete, hopefully, the handbook, um, at least at this time, because it's always a work in progress. We are shooting for uh, shortly after that May 15th deadline for review comments. So hopefully in the second half of May, we'll be releasing the rest of the handbook. Those parts are all written. They just are in the review phase at this point, the internal review. Then they'll go out for um, a complete NRCS and external interagency review which is what's happening with uh, these parts right now. So section one, the parts here, 100, 200, 300 that are in orange are the ones that are, um, that I'm going to go over today and they're the ones that have been released for your review. Um, and, and I'll talk about each of them in turn, well, George and I will. Uh, part 200, uh, 202 and 203 are, um, are kind of, you know, how to go about working with partners and managing meetings and work agreements, and, um, and they'll be out uh, with the second half. And part 301, which is looking at certification for um, quality control reviewers, we are actually thinking about the, the um, letting that one be tabled for a while and see whether we really need that, because at this point, the way it reads in the handbook, the um, the Technical team will pr 
proposed the reviewer, and the um, the management team will approve the quality control reviewer, and that may be enough. If we get feedback after this is in place that we need, you know, people need more qualifications, that the, the teams need to know more about whether or not these people are qualified, then we'll, we'll look back into that. But we do have a section um, written. We're just going to hold it back. Um, so going into part 100, uh, there's a purpose, a definition, and the definition and, and much of the handbook comes from the interagency handbook. Uh, again, what we've done is, is um, expanded it uh, so that it includes forestry. This uh, definition for ecological sites, of course, is, is generic to the land type. Um, so a distinctive kind of land based on recurring soil and landform. Uh, you know, I think most of you are probably um, uh, very familiar with this. Uh, basically, we're looking at uh, distinctive kinds and amounts of vegetation and the ability to respond similarly to, uh, to disturbances, whether management or natural. So that's the, the basic definition that drives the, the uh, description of an ecological site. Um, part 100.02, principal references and their maintenance. Uh, these are the places, uh, the references uh, in NRCS that have, uh, that site ecological, talk about ecological sites. And um, these, what will happen is that a lot of the information in those manuals will be um, will will be superseded by this new manual. But the the parts in the in these existing manuals and handbooks that talk about how to use an ecological site description, you know, what it's good for, those will all remain. Um, so as these are replaced, um, they. Um, that are updated, they will lose their um, d discussion of, of how to and what is an ecological site description. Um, so in 100.03, roles and responsibilities, it's a very long list of uh, folks and, and what their roles and responsibilities are as they pertain to ecological site description development. Uh, we go from uh, the deputy chiefs to field staff and everybody in between. And, um, and, and this is the general roles here, the sort of the overall roles. And in 200 and 300, we also have roles and responsibilities specific to those um, uh, to those parts, the project management and QA, QC, and correlation. Um, in 100.04 is progress reporting. And we've got uh, a couple of different things under progress reporting. One is milestones, and right now in NASIS you can see them, and the, the most updated version um, is in this Exhibit 100 of, the, of the, the handbook that's out for review. There are 16 milestones, and they can be useful uh, for project management to see how far, you know, how, whether uh, uh, dates and targets are being met and, you know, the percent that is done. And it's, I think, particularly useful when uh, a project is uh, longer than a year. And another uh, concept that is a little bit new but um, equivalent to uh, the soils side of things is the levels of completion. And what we have in the, and defined in the manual are provisional ecological sites, approved ESDs and correlated ESDs. The provisional ecological site is essentially a placeholder for an, ec for an ecological site. It's established after some research has been done, some reconnaissance, and, and there are initial concepts of what is, what is this ecological site going to be. What are, What's the primary vegetation? What's the primary community? Um, you can 
probably need to have in the initial state and transition model. And um, you will have to have a quality control, quality assurance review. And then you <clears throat> enter the name and number into the database. And that's, that's your placeholder. It's it's also a milestone, um, but it's nothing that's uh, necessarily released to the public at this point. The next level of completion is the approved ESD, and it is available for public release. However, it is not considered a completed ESD product. So I'd like to, I'd like to reiterate that. The approved ESD is not considered a completed ESD product, okay? It, it must contain a minimum set of information, and that information is defined in Exhibit 100.2 in the handbook. Um, it actually meets the required information in the interagency handbook. Um, at, at, and in addition to having those components, it also has to have a quality control review and at least one quality assurance review, and that's not the that's the progress review, not the initial review. It's signed by the Soil Survey Regional Director and certified by state conservationists and partners. Um, and again, it can be put out for public release. And the idea behind this is that there's going to be a lot of good information in there that can be used, and there may be some time before the full ecological site description is completed. So why not get this out there? We know it's good information. We're just going to be adding to it to get the, um, the completed correlated ESD. And that's where we come to the final product, which is what we're calling the correlated ESD. It, again, has a minimum set of information. The primary difference between this and the approved is that there's more information about alternative states here, whereas in the approved, it's, it's mostly information about the reference state. Then we're going and looking at, at other alternative states here in the correlated ESD in terms of the amount of information that's in there. But it's, it's got to go through the entire correlation process. Um, it actually exceeds the um, what is uh, identified as uh, it's sufficient information in the uh, interagency handbook, but you know I kind of think of that like federal, like state and federal. You know the state or NRCS, we can do do more. We can't do less than what's in the interagency manual. So, um, <clears throat> quality control review, uh, also past final quality assurance, and the correlation conference. We'll talk more about these things. Um, it, don't worry if you don't know what the, they are. Um, Final correlation signed by the Soil Survey Regional Director. It's certified for release by state conservationists and any partners. And um, you can see that in Exhibit uh, 300 8, the a, uh, template uh, certification sheet. Right. So, moving on to part 100.5, looking at performance measures. So, we were looking at, at progress review. Now, we're moving on to performance measures, which is uh, what, you know, what the agency counts, you know, where, where we get, um, you know, our little widgets here. And, and this is in acres. And, um, and you can only count acres for a correlated ESD. Certainly not for a provisional ecological site and, and not for an approved ESD either, only the correlated. And um, so any brand new pro uh, projects with uh, cor for correlated ESDs will get acreage equal to the aerial expense of the site. Um, and then for updates, the amount of the acreage will be uh, determined, well, proposed first by the technical team and then um, concurred and approved by the management team. And it will depend on the amount of work that's required. If you are just doing some updates in the office, it might be you know, like SDJR, those of you that are um, uh, working on that or uh, Aware of that, the folks that do those kinds of updates are getting 20% uh, of the acreage. That's that's one thing. But if you're doing, a, you know, full field uh, a, a, um, examination, um, you may get 
it's 100 percent of the acres. So it could be, you know, anything in between. Um, we also have a couple other things that are written up that um, we decided to hold back for a pilot, and that is a complexity measure that will serve uh, to modify the amount of acreage. Um, I think everyone, everyone can agree that uh, one ecosystem is not equivalent to another, and so for those that uh, are highly complex, um, we are looking at the idea of, of maybe giving some sort of a, a multiplier to that. So you might get 1.5 acres for every acre, something you know. Um, and so we are actually looking for people that are interested in piloting that. So anybody on the line or in the room here that uh, would like to be a part of that, uh, just contact me. Um, the other thing that, that we've considered but haven't really fleshed out yet is a potential uh, PRS reporting item so that we've got something on uh, for uh, both uh, of the uh, deputy areas that are involved. Uh, so now we going to part 200, and I'm going to hand it over to George. All right. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, and I will uh, try to go over a set of brief contents of what's in uh, part 200, which is the project management. Uh, this part deals with the project planning and management process, which uh, is utilized to assist you know, in planning, prioritizing, and implement implementation of your know, ecological site activities. It does follow the uh, basic process that's outlined in Part 608 of the National Soil Survey Handbook, so you should see some, hopefully, the similarities to Part 608. Uh, there's a section of roles and responsibilities that are specific to project planning. They're identified in this part. Uh, I would encourage you to look at those roles. Those roles identified all the way from Soil Survey Regional Offices down through the National Centers, State Offices, Area Field Offices, the soil survey offices and partners as far as their involvement in, uh, in projects and project planning and project implementation. Uh, within the, the structure, we wanted to highlight here the board advisors, the management team, and the technical team. First, looking at the structure and membership of those different groups, and then later on, uh, talk a little bit about the roles as it pertains specifically to project planning. So uh, starting with the technical team, and again, I think you'll see this is very similar to Part 608 in the Soil Survey Handbook. Uh, the technical team would be established by the MLRA region. Uh, it would be chaired by the MLRA Soil Survey Office leader. Uh, and within the membership of the technical team would include the Soil Survey staff, could include the uh, field area state office staff, could even include regional discipline specialists, and uh, if needed, uh, to assist the technical team. And also than any other partners, other agencies or NGOs uh, that might be uh, want to get involved in the ecological site effort. So the technical team is that local team at the MLRA Soil Survey Office level that would actually be doing most of the work uh, associated with actually developing the ecological site descriptions. And then, then there's the management team. Uh, they need to be established either by the MLRA region or Soil Survey region. Uh, of course, then the chair, they know how it's structured. It is by MLRA, so it could be chaired by the regional director of the Soil Survey Regional Office or by the state soil scientist. And the membership of the management team would include the state soil scientist, the state resource conservationist, state technical discipline specialist as appropriate for that uh, uh, regional area, and then again, any other partners such as agencies and universities or NGOs uh, that might be uh, want to join with, with the management team. And then the next structure is the Board of Advisors. Uh, again, it can be established either by the MLRA or the Soil Survey Region. And the chair of that one, as identified in the handbook right now, says will be determined by the members. Uh, and the members are the state conservationists and then other states, federal, state, and other entities with lands on which ecological site descriptions may occur. For example, it might include a, a state BLM director or a regional forester from a forest service region uh, trying to if they have ESDs that occur within either that MLRA or Soil Survey region. So that identifies kind of the hierarchy of the different teams. And again, I think that's very comparable to what's in Part 608. And we'll talk a little bit more about the roles as we talk more about project planning. 
resources that are needed to accomplish those tasks, and then what timelines are, uh, we're going to try to do to complete, complete this work. And uh, we've identified in there the long-range plan, project plan, and annual plans that will be utilized to support you know, the proposed ecological site activities. And the long-range plan should identify activities that are needed to complete the ecological site projects in the say, next five plus years. And, for example, you may already have existing long-range plans, and these may, long-range plans may need to be updated to incorporate these new ecological site activities into those current plans. And then the project plan would uh, just describe the activities that hopefully will be accomplished in addressing one or more of the priorities that you've identified in your long-range plan. And then the annual plans are just utilized to identify the tasks and responsibilities that you hope to accomplish during uh, that physical year. So, and then there's some other sections, part 200, 0 .03, 0 .04, and 0 .05, that deal with the development of project plans, the prioritization of the plans, and the approval of project plans. And I'll try to go through those looking, hopefully, at this uh, little diagram. The project plans concerning uh, ecological site activities may vary in their scope. For example, a project may involve only updating some very minor details within an ecological site description or a group of site descriptions that you know, might only take a few weeks to a few months to complete. So hopefully in that case, you know, the project plan should be very simple, very short. But you may have other projects that are designed to go through the entire development process for an ecological site, and these may take several years, you know, maybe five or more years to complete, especially when you have some very complex landscapes. So the scope of the project plan, you know, like I said, can, can vary depending upon, you know, the actual project. But the project plan should identify the objectives of the plan, what is the priority that's assigned to this project, you know, what are the tasks that are to be completed, who's going to be responsible for completing those tasks, and then when will those tasks be completed. Again, the technical team is the one that is responsible for drafting these project plans. And... Uh, then they should also assign a priority to those project plans, and then they would submit those to the management team. And the uh, MLRA soil survey leader would be the one that submits the, uh, the project plan to the management team. And then the management team, then they review all the plans, and then they are also the ones that approve the project plans. And then once the project plans and their priority uh, order are established by the management team, then they're forwarded to the board of advisors. Uh, by the regional director for the board's review and concurrence. And then, uh, so hopefully the board will be reviewing them to ensure that uh, what's being developed locally is uh, it being balanced with one of the state and national issues. I think on this diagram you can see the arrows are all going from the technical team to the management team to the board of advisors. But I can also see where the arrows could go the other way. For example, if uh, there was some national initiative or some state had a specific need, that the Board of Advisors might recommend that down to the management team for its consideration in, uh, in getting to a technical team to develop a project plan. So that kind of gives a quick overview of the project plans, uh, the structure. Uh, you know, again, they're developed by the technical team, approved by the management team, and reviewed and concurred in by the, uh, by the Board of Advisors. Uh, the last part of this Part 200 has to do with revisions and updates. And you know, as with any technical tool we have, over time there's always a need to revise or update. You know, the, the ESD, is, the ecological site description, is no different. You know, then we may have some new information that may be identified or we may actually find some errors that need to be corrected. So since the ecological site description is part of the Fair Lobby's tech guide at this point, you know, any new information or errors should be brought to the attention of the appropriate state technical discipline specialist. And then based on the extent of the changes that are needed, there are two different approaches have been identified uh, within the handbook. Uh, minor changes are referred to as revisions. Uh, this could be something as simple as just a database update that can be done in the office or you know, something that doesn't take a lot of field time. In that case, the state technical specialist would work with their appropriate state resource conservationist, who remember as a member of the management team, and they would work with the management team to obtain approval to make those edits, 
these products are have good information in them, correct information, and hopefully useful information. So this very involved uh, diagram really goes over parts that 300.02 to 300.05, you know, going from quality control to publishing. So starting at the left-hand corner, and again, you know, as uh, as George uh, pointed out with the, the earlier um, uh, tech team, uh, you know, the, the project planning uh, uh, diagram, these arrows are one way, but at any point, if there's if there's an issue, it's it's going to go back. You know, that, that's that, that's always a possibility. That, uh, but uh, assuming that there there are no no issues uh, with quality control, all participants in the project, all the tech team participants, are responsible for quality control uh, in their day to day work on a project. But there is a, a formal process for QC review, and the QC reviewer is um, is determined in the uh, in the project proposal, approved by the management team, and that person really shouldn't be otherwise part of the project. They should be someone that comes in and looks at the at the quality of the data, make sure, you know, that the numbers are looking right, that the, that the methods are, are appropriate, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, the, the people involved are the MLRA, Ecological Site Specialists, State Area Field Specialists, even, um, NTSC Specialists as needed, Soil Scientists, um, and, uh, um, and uh, Technical specialists from other agencies as well, depending on agreements and that sort of thing. Um, and it's done throughout the project. And whenever there is a formal QC review, that QC reviewer is the person who signs off on it. Uh, for quality assurance, the regional um, uh, ecological site specialists are the people with responsibility for that. And what they're, what they're doing is uh, making sure that standards are followed. There, there are three types of quality assurance reviews, an initial review, and, and there they look at the project. They make sure everybody has the skills that are needed. If not, they, they can do some training or you know, suggest additional personnel, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's a progress review, and that should occur at least once a year on a multi-year project. But any time that, that they feel they need some uh, technical assistance, a, a QA can come out uh, and, and help with that. And then the final uh, QA review is when all the project tasks are completed, then there's an overall review. And the, the regional uh, ecological site specialists will also be making use of, of the quality control reviews and be, you know, talking with the folks that have been involved on the technical team. Um, there's quite a few signatures. We're following uh, 614 in the soil survey handbook. Um, this may get streamlined. I'm interested to get get feedback on this particular thing, but uh, we've got the, the regional uh, ESS signing off, uh, the soil survey uh, office leader, the uh, management team members, the state conservationists, uh, agency partners as appropriate, and the um, regional directors. Okay, then uh, final correlation is uh, is what happens after the Q QA review and we're nearing completion of the project. We, they have a correlation conference, and that includes uh, any uh, SSO staff, uh, state staff, um, uh, SSRO staff that are that have been involved in the project, um, partners, and it's it's led by the regional ecological site specialists, and that person also you know. Um, it, it facilitates it and prepares the, the correlation document. And um, the uh, regional director is the person who signs off on it. And, and, and they sign off on the final correlation document. So um, the next step is certification. 
and the regional ESF uh, transmits the final correlation documents, certification pages, you know, all of the associated materials to the states that are involved um, and the states and partners, uh, the state conservationists or designee and agency partners as, need, as appropriate sign off on that uh, following the final correlation. And the SSRO, the, which is the old MO, at MO, this is the Soil Survey Regional Office. I just realized some people may not be up on those, um, on the new acronyms. Um, the, the SSRO um, maintains copies of the signed documents. And then the very final step is actually publishing this information. And the SSRO is the one that releases the, it gives the, um, the go-ahead to release the ESDs into ESIS, and the state con is the one that gives the go-ahead to release information into uh, the field office technical guide. And that's after all of the signatures have been collected and received back in the, M back in the uh, SSRO. And then there are just... Uh, Two more sections to go over on part 300. Uh, this, this one we see um, being needed for a, a little while and then uh, riding off into the sunset. Um, it's uh, part 300.07, currently approved, meeting previous standards. So any currently approved ESDs that meet guidance in the range and pasture handbook or the National Forestry Manual, you've got the dates there on the slide, um, may remain as approved documents in the database. Please do not go through and remove or unapprove or otherwise get rid of the, this information with, without, uh, you know, without notifying people. It's, it's okay. Now, it is something that could be subject to an update or a revision, depending on the amount of work that would be needed to bring it up to the new standards. But for now, this is, this is fine, and we're going to leave it the way it is until otherwise notified. So the next step will tell you about how, what a notification process would be. Um, and this, again, is, is uh, modeled after uh, the Soil Survey Handbook. And to, uh, part 08, deactivation of ESDs. So you don't just unapprove it or say, oh, this is no good and, and, and uh, somehow wipe the database. Um, and you have to notify all state and field offices that, that were involved or should have been involved uh, with a memorandum, formal me memo, um, supporting reasons why it doesn't meet standards and you're proposing that it should be deactivated. Uh, full deactivation that probably would happen if, if there's been a new ecological site that, that um, you know, and there's overlap and it seems like they need, you know, that, that the old concepts are, are no longer, you know, with additional information, these old concepts aren't holding up. But, you know, you may... You may want to deactivate, I suppose, if, if things are um, just so out of date and have, you know, very little information in there. That's another potential reason. But you have to have at least 45 days at, um, to allow people to file an objection. Hopefully, instead, there will be conversations held and decide what could be done to bring, to bring the current the information in the uh, database up to current standards rather than actually going through a, a, to a full deactivation. But um, if, if after objections or no objections, the, um, the uh, Soil Survey Regional Office will deactivate after the waiting period and all efforts for mitigation of issues are exhausted. So it should be a, a, a process, not just a quick flick of a wrist and click of a button. So in, in summary, 
we gave an overview of the first section of a three-part handbook, Policies and Procedures, today. Um, hopefully it sparked your interest and you'll go and read the, uh, the handbook that's been sent out. And again, that was under National Bulletin 190-13-9. And uh, comments uh, are due by May 15th. And you can send them either to me or to George. And our emails are right here. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. And so we'll open it up to some questions. And again, you can ask your questions uh, from the room here and as well as online. There's a Q&A tab in your live meeting window. You can only ask one question at a time until we clear that. So you'll have to be patient about your uh, questions. And uh, here in the room, we'll just ask that uh, questions that are asked, that we kind of paraphrase the question or restate the question so it's part of the recording. So there's one here in the room. I'll start with that one. Oh. So there's some discussion here in the room, but I think the people online are missing out on that. So we need to have you come up here to say it or continue that later. Yeah, come up. So, yeah. Dan's, so Dan's going to come up. Reiterating and, those two types of, uh, of correlation. Oh, no, all, all I would say was, you know, just going back to the slide, is that there are two types of correlation. Our, our, our next question has a couple of 
question, but then one. My ESI area covers two MLRA sole survey offices, yet I'm supervised by a single sole survey office leader. Do you consider this a problem? And then That's the second question, question. <laughs> is, uh, is supervision of ESI personnel likely to remain as is, that, under, that is under the MLRA office leader? Uh, I'll, I'll start with George. Is it okay if I take this one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. For consistent supervision of the ESI personnel, like yes, the um, there is no plan in the current reorganization scheme to change the supervision of the. Um, uh, what are now called MLRA ecological site specialists. So you guys are messes, MLRA ESSs. And um, it, but the other one, um, I would hope that it would not be a problem that that your um, your area of, of, of um, responsibility crosses over. And if it is, then we we have an educational opportunity <laughs> so that, um, so that uh, the, um, the MLRA, the Soil Survey Office leaders understand that, um, uh, um, you know, that, that you have, um, you know, you have to work in both. And you wouldn't work in, you probably wouldn't work in both on one project. You may, depending on if they're, you know, ideally, to, and, and a project would remain within one MLRA, but the lines aren't perfect, so it may cross over slightly. I would say that you um, you probably just need to have a talk with both of those people. It certainly would be appropriate for your specific supervisor to be the lead on on all of the projects that that you develop. However, um, I think it would also be fine when you are entirely in or mostly in the other MLRA to have that other um, office leader uh, be the lead uh, person for the project. So um, it's really between the, the three of you to discuss and uh, determine what works best. And it's not something that we have uh, mandated or really even covered in the, uh, in, in the standards handbook, but we have purposely left you know, some things a little open so that uh, so that people can find what works best for them in their area. I can handle this next question. <clears throat> Will the slides for the presentation be made available? And the answer is yes. Uh, apparently they like the, the flow chart diagrams that were included. And the uh, these will be made available on our National Soil Survey Center YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link to that bottom of the advertisement of what you've received. And if you don't have it, it's at uh, www.youtube.com slash user slash NRCS NSSC. So those will be available online in the next few business days. Next question is, are we going to discuss Section 1, Part 300.04, interim release of data? Hey, George, I'll let you take it since I've been talking. Uh, yeah, I think that section deals with the uh, pruned ESD uh, concept that Susan outlined. Uh, so I'm not for sure. You know, basically it has to go through that quality control, quality assurance uh, review before it can be released uh, as an in product. Uh, but again, it can be made available because we do want to get those ones out there that have enough information in it that's useful. Uh, we do want to get them out and made available to people to use. So, that, uh, again, I think Susan stressed that those are not completed product, products. Uh, but uh, so I'm not for sure what else we would say. I think it's pretty much a, a repeat of what uh, what Susan identified when she talked about the approved ESP. And it also provides us with an opportunity to for some use of those ecological sites to be able to add some further testing to the site concepts to make sure that. We still have them very uh, on a good solid foundation too. Um, the, the one, the big difference between the, the the approval of the interim or approved ESD versus the correlated final product is that 
you for the interim, you only have to have a progress review. You don't have a final QA review. You don't have the correlation conference or the final correlation. Um, you, uh, it still goes to the, the, um, to the state for approval um, and the, the um, and, and all of the people sign off on the progress review as well, including the, the um, SSRD. So we've got yeah. It. yeah. Yeah, there's actually an exhibit in 300 for the signature page to ensure that all signatures that are needed are obtained before it is released. This next question is a question about the uh, audience for ESDs, and they're having a debate amongst their staff as to who the audience for these ESDs is for. Are we writing these for field office staff and other natural resource professionals or for the general public? I, I would say both. Um, George, you want yeah, to? Yeah, that, that, that's the attempt is to write, you know, write it fully for both of those groups. Uh, we definitely want to ensure that it's uh, for natural resource managers, our field office staff, the other staff associated with you know, other agencies, uh, park service, et cetera. But hopefully it's also uh, in a format uh, that's understandable by the general public, too. If not, then we need to have some education uh, information that we need to provide on that, too. And, and we've talked about, you know, down the line that uh, in web soil survey, having customizable reports where, you know, you want to go from one state to another state, you might just be able to click those up as objects and, and get just the information you need for management. So for the general public, um, where, at, where as uh, the, the uh, agencies and our field office staff may want to have them more in-depth information. This next one is a kind of a two-part question. Um, how do you want us to submit our comments? Track changes in Word and some other document? Um, yeah, track changes is great, but we'll, we'll take them any way that's legible. <laughs> and then a, a, a follow-up. Email is good, yeah. And then Sorry. a follow-up question, are we going to have more than one category for approval in ESIS. So in other words, will we have a provisional category or will we have provisional and correlated as well? I think they meant accepted and correlated as well. Right. Right, approved and correlated. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right now, within the database, there's only one mechanism, but that's, there's a design team that's putting to put together some requirements, and these will be the requirements, hopefully, as we redesign ESIS the ecological site description database, that, yeah, that, that will need to be uh, one of the considerations. We've, we've got business requirements for, for that uh, completed. They're, they are in review. Uh, next question, when will the glossary become available? <laughs> hey, George. I think <laughs> your name is first on that one. See if they can chase down. If you can't chase down what happened, see 
if they can and uh, figure it out from there and go through the, the process. That I assume somebody decided to uh, deactivate or unapprove an ESIS because they didn't think it was up to standards, which is, you know, obviously not a policy that we're hoping for to just go ahead and, and uh, deactivate without notifying people. So, you know, there, there needs to be some conversation. Uh, next question. Most ecological sites are complex and cannot be completed in one year. So how is one person to rack up acres per year? Um, huh. Well, the, the goal, for, oh boy, there's a lot in that question. Um, yes, we agree. For, for a new ecological site, uh, um, or initial, if you want to use that word, you would, um, it would not be expected to be completed within one year. And so you would be, you know, hopefully your um, supervisor would be using the, uh, instead of the performance measures, you would be using the, the uh, uh, progress reporting instruments, like the milestones, to uh, see how, how uh, the project is progressing. And it shouldn't be just one person uh, in the hot seat for that because the technical team should be an entire group working uh, together on, uh, on the uh, de development of the ecological site description. So I, do, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think you're right. Yeah, we don't there's no expectation that you would complete ecological sites within a year if you're starting from a, with a brand new one. Susan, do you want to add to that with the context of the next question? Yeah, so we have another question here that says, as a project leader, I'm supposed to report progress acres every year. Why can't we report acres at each of the three approval steps? This would be beneficial for multi-year ESD projects. Well, the primary reason why we decided not to report acres um, before it was complete was that we were afraid that we would then not get completed products if people were able to, you know, count their acres um, beforehand. Um, you know, with, if we get a lot of comments to the contrary, we, you know, it could be uh, reconsidered. However, um, well, provisional doesn't make sense to claim acres because you're just saying, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be its own ecological site. I don't have enough information. And it's, uh, you'll, if you notice in the handbook and on our slides, it just said provisional ecological site. It did not say provisional ecological site description. So you don't really have a, a product. So that one doesn't, wouldn't make sense at all. The, but the approved, you know, is a possibility. It's something that, you know, has been discussed. Um, you know, as I said, we did decided against it for the reason I stated, um, but we do want, you know, we have been working with uh, the regional directors and um, uh, to make sure that they realize and maybe need to do more education there to make sure that, you know, when it's a, a big project that the, that the performance Rather than performance measures the acres, they, they look at the um, at, at the, the progress track. So that's the that's the main uh, thing. And you know, what, certainly uh, we've gotten you know good feedback on milestones for performance tracking from from the regional director. So uh, yeah, may, I, I think it may be again. Some, some education and discussion, um, but uh, we, you know we're not opposed if we get a you know a whole bunch of people saying saying you know we want to we need to claim acres for a proof we could consider it. Okay. What do they do for soil survey? Do you get when you get the interim product? You don't. Yeah. Yeah. Too much weight on acres. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, they can't, they can't talk, but they're not allowed to talk here. But, yeah, those of you out there thinking, you know, let's, uh, um, you know, you don't like it the way it is right now, you know, give us some ideas. And definitely, you know, anytime you um, have, have something in the handbook, this is the time to offer up alternatives. Um, it's not set in stone. So, um, you know, we do want to hear from you, and it's always more helpful to offer an alternative than to just say, I don't like this. So, and this one does have an alternative. Um, acres for a free. Our, our next question, should an individual project refer to one specific ESD or to a broader MRA-wide project working on an entire component ecological site budget? Uh, the latter, it probably wouldn't be as big as, as an entire MLRA. It would probably be a subset of the MLRA. Um, hey, Georgia, I, I'm not letting you talk. Do you want to? You want to go? Uh, no, no, you're done. That's exactly what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, you could have uh, a project that may include only one or two, or like, you could include, you know, a very limited number of ecological sites. You know, maybe it's just you know, it's something that was identified. Uh, you know, we had an ecological site concept issue amongst a group of, say, the ecological sites within this uh, LRU or MRA, so it may not include the entire MRA, but it may only include you know, just a few sites. And you know, the, some states, there some states or regions uh, don't have LRUs within, uh, but can substitute uh, section or subsection from the national hierarchy that the Forest Service uses. So that's another another way to parse out your uh, projects. Next question: Will the state soil scientists have any approval authority, like the SRC? I don't think they are given signature authority in the current draft. Um, yes, they are. Um, every time you see SRC, you should see state soil scientists. And if you don't, it was an oversight. And we need to add it. <laughs> so. Are there specific timelines established for states which have not already developed ESDs to begin work toward development? Um, Let's see. The um, we're, if you haven't already begun work, then you may be behind. <laughs> but um, so uh, there's not specific timelines. Um, but uh, you know, if if you're interested in getting um, uh, getting up to speed, then you know you can contact your regional ecological site specialist or um, uh, your NCSC specialist or uh, me or George or our staff, and uh, um, we can see what we can do for you to help get started. We've been doing workshops. All, all of the above people that, that, um, or groups have been uh, doing workshops uh, across the U.S. And I think you've answered this question, but just to be clear, uh, who do you envision doing most of the ESD description development? Is it MLRA offices, state office staff? George, you want to you wanna yeah, address that? Should be, yeah, it should be the local work group. I mean, the, you know, as you put together your technical team, so we're recommending that you establish a local work group. Uh, that should be individuals that are knowledgeable in that area. And, you know, different ones of those may be assigned different tasks as you develop your project plans. So, you know, it's not envisioned that it would be a and the entity or uh, one person that's doing all the work. There may be somebody coordinating a lot of the work, but we need to draw in all that expertise that's out there. Uh, so, the, you know, as we get to looking at Part 500 and, and Thursday, you know, I think that's one of the steps in the process is to establish this local work group. And it absolutely has to be a collaborative process. It just it won't be accelerated by you know having just ecological sciences or just soils involved. They have to be involved from you know from the beginning to the end. Um, next question is about QC reviews. 
what's the reasoning for having the QC reviewer be someone that is not otherwise working on the project? So you're not reviewing your own work, which is always perfect all the time, right? How will acres be reported for approval, not correlated to ESDs? How will acres be reported for approved, not correlated to ESDs? Well, right now, acres will not be reported for approved ESDs, only for correlated ESDs. And acres will be um, the, the acres for those components that are correlated to that ESD the extent of that, of those components. So we have some sort of policy issues here. Yeah, I mean, I, we can keep going as long as people, you know, I, I can keep on. Do you, can, do you have time, George, to keep going? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. We'll keep it for a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, here's a question. How are Soul Survey Office leaders going to find time for these new responsibilities? <laughs> <laughs> oh, join the club, boy. Um, well, you know, Soul Survey Office leaders um, are the ones responsible because the project is coming out of, of their office, but they aren't necessarily the ones out in the field doing the work. Uh, they, they may be the one, you know, especially if you don't have an MLRA ESS in your office, you, the soil survey office leader may be the one making sure that people are adhering to deadlines at the, and that the right people are doing the right, you know, the, the appropriate things, you know, like the veg people, measure veg, that kind of thing. Um, but um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to take up a a lot of time, one would hope. I don't know. Sort of a related question. When are offices expected to implement this information? Oh, um, well, you, you, I think the, the information in the handbook, I, I would say it does, it does not become policy until it goes out as a national instruction. Right now it's out for review. Um, you know, we may have major changes, although it's been reviewed fairly extensively, uh, both at headquarters and you know, by our group of 30 to 40 people. So, you know, in general, I wouldn't think that there would be a lot of major changes. So you certainly could start, I mean, certainly start thinking in these terms, but you won't be held to it until it goes out through the instruction. So it's right now, it's out for review, then we're going to take the comments, make, you know, review all of the comments, make changes as appropriate, um, and then send it out as an instruction. And that, at that point, it becomes policy, and you are uh, expected to adhere to what's in, in the handbook. This next question relates to partnerships with the Forest Service. Um, it's likely that where this person works, PSDs are going to be uh, at least partially, if not fully, located in a national forest. So will the U.S. Forest Service have uh, joint signature review responsibilities for these forest land ESDs? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, George. Uh, yes, they would. Uh, and uh, if it's... If the ranch lands involved, we already have an agreement with them. So, you know, as you're putting together your, your work plans and local work groups, you know, they should be participating in that. But, but yes, uh, I think uh, on all of the review documents, the uh, quality assurance, correlation, uh, even on certification, there's a block on there for the partners to sign off on the final documents. And I guess it sort of depends on the nature of the uh of the collaboration, whether, you know, they'll have people, you know, in the field with you, so then there'll be, you know, tech team members, or if it's only the, the regional forester, then they would act the, as a board of advisors, you know. So it just depends on who's, who's involved. It can be, you know, anywhere 
and everywhere along the planning process and implementation. Our next question, our technical team and local work group synonymous. They can be, but not necessarily. The technical team may be a, a broader group that looks at, you know, the, all the projects. So they may actually be the work group, but you may have some specific projects that it may only be a few or certain members of the technical team and maybe some other other partners that might make up the work group. So in some cases they may be, but not necessarily in all cases. Uh, the next couple questions deal with large ESDs. Uh, so, in other words, when you have a large ESD of over a million acres, are any provisions in place to accommodate this type of large project reporting-wise? Any issues with reporting or considerations if you have a really large uh, ESD that you're working with? I don't see why there would be any problems. Um, you might you might want to give some more information in the later I mean, you type in some more information because I, I, I'm not sure why there would be any problems with that. Next question, can an ecosite be correlated if the soil survey is not yet complete? If so, how are acres calculated for an ecosite that still has extant or unmapped land? That is a really good question. Um, the ESDs have been done without without the soils being fully surveyed. Um, ideally, um, they would be done hand in hand, so the, the you know soils would be mapped as the veg data was being taken. Um, when you don't have it, I you know that's a good question, I, and I don't have an answer for you right now. And then, yeah, the last, and yeah. then our last question before I close it out. Are ESDs planned to be a component or built into the CDSI conservation desktop planning software? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we are. We're working with them uh, to integrate that. We're also uh, within the what they call the class tool, the grazing resource assessment uh, system within CDSI, the wise on the uh, one of the components that you could use within that is the ecological site layer to do your inventory. So we are working with the CDSI group to try to integrate it where we can. And we're hoping to have a, a common uh, user um, interface with them. But we'll, we, we still haven't gotten them to pony up to, to do that for us. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be on the uh, plant data collection when you're out doing some type of inventory. Because yeah. the inventory that you may do for the ecological site may be very similar to the same inventory that's done on a conservation plant. So our hope is that we would have a common, some type of common database and hopefully a common type of user interface so that an, an employer would only have to learn one interface. Right, and we've been in discussions about that with uh, different areas of the agency, NRI, um, and CDSI, uh -huh. and um, and we are we already have the agreement that we'll be using the same methods um, or at least you know subsets of the of a of a unified methods list, and so um, there's there's really no reason why we shouldn't have a common interface. Um, and uh, potentially the same database, but at least a seamless database that the user doesn't see any, any differences. Well, with that, we're out of time. I need to close out the, the webinar, and I know we have a couple of questions that have been answered, but uh, we'll take a look at those and maybe follow up with you directly if we can. Uh, again, today's webinar was an overview of Section 1 of the handbook, and uh, on the 18th, there will be a companion webinar to this one on Section 2, Ecological Site Concept and Description Development. And again, we encourage you to submit comments on both those sections that are out for review. Um, comments are due by May 15th. But one last word. Anytime you have questions, feel free to, um, feel free to contact us. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>